Thank you. You may be seated. All right, and now we are here for oral argument in case number CV 18-0234, U.S. Bank v. Finson. As I noted earlier, the re a recording of these uh, proceedings is being made, so please give your name and the name of your client when you approach the podium. Each side has 20 minutes for your argument, and you're in charge of keeping track of your own time. The clock will reflect the total you have remaining. Please keep in mind we have read the briefs, we've reviewed the record, we have conference and discussed the case among the panel. And with that, you may proceed. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Barbara Ferdy, and I'm here for the appellant, Beth Finson, who's also here with me today. Um, if it pleases the court, I'd like to re reserve five minutes at the end for my rebuttal. Um, we're here today because U.S. Bank is attempting to pocket $133,199 of equity in the Finson home, which belongs to my client, Beth Finson, um, after judicial foreclosure. This lawsuit was settled in the Superior Court at a settlement conference with a specific settlement agreement where the parties both agreed to quote, bear its own costs and fees, period, unquote. Yet when it came time to submit the proposed form of judgment, U.S. Bank submitted in the judgment um, a request for attorney's fees and costs of $133,199. That was an error by the judge to sign that judgment. Beth Finson properly objected to that judgment and that portion of the judgment needs to be overturned. U.S. Bank even admits in its answering brief that an affirmative award of attorney's fees and costs that created a direct financial obligation of my client to pay U.S. Bank would have violated the terms of the settlement agreements, right in the answering brief at page 17. So those, that fee award was improper. The judgment was submitted, it was signed, um, and gutted a good portion of the Finson equity in the home. I believe there's at least $200,000 worth of equity after the judicial foreclosure takes place. So the settlement agreement must be enforced as it's written. This is pretty basic first year contract law. Um, contract cannot be interpreted such as to pervert or do violence to the language. You can't add things to the language. That's exactly what the Superior Court did when it uh, granted those attorney's fees and costs of 133 grand. The cardinal rule in foreclosure is that when it comes to interpreting contracts, deeds of trust, deeds of trust statutes, they are to be interpreted in favor of the borrower, not against the borrower. U.S. Bank claims that their waiver of fees, in spite the general way in which that waiver was stated, was simply the perfunctory task of filing the notice of dismissal. That's totally unsupported by the terms of the settlement agreement. If that's what U.S. Bank had wanted, they should have negotiated for it in the settlement conference. They didn't. They should have insisted those terms were in the settlement agreement. They didn't. Attorney's fees and costs in their entirety were waived in that settlement. How much of that 133000 you can tell, was related to the foreclosure proceedings? Well, the 133000 Your Honor, is from three separate pieces of litigation. Um, I wasn't involved. I got involved in this final piece of litigation only shortly before judgment was entered. Um, but my understanding is that all three of the pieces of litigation were related to um, someone. U.S. Bank wasn't a party in the other litigation, from my understanding, was trying to foreclose on the Finson home. So they're all foreclosure litigation. Right, well, with respect to the other two pieces of litigation, did, did the bank not have the opportunity to seek fees, if appropriate, in, in those separate actions? I'm absolutely assuming, Judge, that they did. Um, and that's where they should have sought fees if they intended to get fees. Yes. Now, U.S. Bank, even in Superior Court, insisted in uh, filing that they made that the settlement agreement um, was the full and final settlement, and any term that wasn't in there was waived. 
And so U.S. Bank clearly waived their attorney's fees and costs. Um, U.S. Bank then argues that we need to go back and look at the 2004 contracts between the parties. Well, that doesn't make any sense because the settlement agreement actually overrides any entitlement to fees and costs under the note or the deed of trust. But if we go back and look at paragraph 9 of the deed of trust, which is U.S. Bank's argument that these fees and costs became debt secured by the deed of trust, it's not supported by the language in the deed of trust. Paragraph 9 allows, under very limited circumstances, for certain expenses to be added as debt that's secured by the deed of trust, but those expenses are not attorney's fees and costs in foreclosure litigation. There are expenses to protect or assess the value of the property or to secure or repair the property. So that's, that's not obviously what we're talking about here. This is attorney's fees incurred by Ballard Spar in three separate pieces of litigation um, that got added into this judgment improperly under the settlement agreement. But even if paragraph 9 applied under the descriptions of what kinds of expenses can be added to the debt, it doesn't apply because the fees were not paid by the lender. Let's assume U.S. Bank is the lender. I think U.S. Bank would say it's the lender. Those fees, all those uh, fee bills, went to PNC Bank, a non-party here. There's no evidence other than those invoices, and in fact those invoices even prop are not properly in the record, um, related to who paid those fees. But the bills went to PNC Bank, so PNC Bank probably paid them. U.S. Bank never put on any evidence that U.S. Bank paid those fees. So once again, paragraph 9 can't apply because the lender did not pay the fees. It doesn't become part of the debt. Instead, what applies is paragraph 22 of the deed of trust, which is specifically related to foreclosure litigation. It says, yes, the lender can sometimes can get attorney's fees and costs for pursuing foreclosure, but U.S. Bank waived that in the settlement agreement. They're not entitled to those attorney's fees and costs. Now, U.S. Bank next makes a bizarre argument um, that there was no judicial order that created a financial obligation for Ms. Finson to pay the $133,000. It's in the judgment. And just because they think they can now take an offset off those excess proceeds doesn't mean they are not getting paid and that Beth Finson isn't required to pay that over. They're trying to reach into her pocket, um, take out 133 grand that she would get in the excess proceeds. That's a direct financial obligation to pay. So that uh, excuse for seeking the 133,000 doesn't fly. Now, they next argue for the first time on appeal, never argued in the Superior Court, that under ARS 33725B, these attorney's fees and costs, which they waived in the settlement agreement, are damages and costs which are recoverable. Well, first, they waived having them in the settlement agreement. But second, you can't, so you can't waive attorney's fees and costs in the settlement agreement and then say, oh, I'm going to slip them in under, under a statutory provision. The settlement agreement waived the attorney's fees and costs. But regardless, under Arizona law, attorney's fees are damages only if a defendant's conduct involves a plaintiff in litigation with others. That's not what happened here. U.S. Bank sued Beth Fenson. So um, these attorney's fees are not damages and costs under 33725B. Now, an additional hurdle to obtaining this $133,000 worth of fees is that there was never a verified motion for attorney's fees fi filed in the lower court. Rule 54 is very clear. When a proposed form of judgment is submitted, the litigant has 20 days to submit a fee motion. No fee motion was ever filed. No verified statement of costs was ever filed. No disclosure of the terms of a fee agreement was ever provided. So Rule 54, F, G, and H were all violated. Now, U.S. Bank claims that it was Beth Finson's burden to tell U.S. Bank that it needed to comply with Rule 54. 
I'm not aware of any Arizona law that says a litigant is required to notify the other side of the rules of civil procedure that it needs to follow. Well, she did object, did she not? We did object, Your Honor, yes. The fees and costs that were awarded were for litigation work of Ballard Spar. They had to submit a fee motion to get them. They didn't. Those fees should not have been awarded. Also, no affidavit was submitted with a person from a person with knowledge to support um, the award of fees and costs. The declaration was signed by a Dorothy Thomas, who is a mortgage officer at non-party PNC Bank. Her declaration is incompetent and inadmissible. She doesn't even attempt to assert that she has personal knowledge of one thing in her declaration. Under the Riches and Eccles cases that I cited, the declaration must be rejected on that basis alone. Superior Court obviously considered it because the judgment was entered for those 133 grand of fees and costs. The With Thomas regard to the information in that affidavit, outside of the attorney's fees portion, but the other, um, like the principal balance, um, unpaid interest, those uh, amounts, does your client dispute those amounts or just dispute the competency of the affidavit as a whole? Um, quite honestly, I don't know if she's ever been given sufficient information to compute the amounts, so I'm not sure that she would admit those amounts are correct. Um, but certainly the declaration is incompetent to set forth the amount due, which is required under ARS 33725A before a judge can enter a judgment of judicial foreclosure. There was simply no admissible evidence before that judge to sign that judgment related to fees or the total amount due. So the declaration was not competent also. Um, Ms. Thomas did not attempt, she didn't say that she even reviewed the docs. She didn't say she was familiar with the preparer of the documents. She didn't say she was familiar with the manner in which the documents were prepared. These are all elements that are required in order to get information into evidence from an exhibit that is attached to a declaration. Nothing was there. Um, the VS case that I cited is exactly the same scenario. A declaration was submitted. Um, the affiant referred to exhibits that were attached and just repeated the information in the exhibits, and the court rejected it, said that's not enough, that's not competency, we can't consider that. So the declaration needs to be excluded, um, and the declaration also doesn't satisfy Rule 803.6 of the Rules of Evidence. Um, I briefed that as well. I won't go through all the detail on that. So there's no admissible evidence presented to the Superior Court of the property inspections, which was Exhibit A to the declaration, the attorney fee billings, which was Exhibit B, or the amount due on the loan set forth in that payoff, which was Exhibit C. There was just no admissible evidence before the court to sign that judgment. So we already touched on um, the entire amount due um, wasn't proven either by admissible evidence. Um, the entire payoff statement that's attached as Exhibit C is inadmissible. Um, and then we have the additional problem of, the, of even the discrepancy in the attorney's fees. One place it says 113000 one place it says 133000 um, The information presented to the Superior Court was contradictory, incompetent, and inadmissible. The judgment should have never been signed. Um, the excess proceeds from this sale will need to be paid over to Beth Finson, and that's why this is such a critical issue. $133,000 that belongs to Beth Finson, U.S. Bank is trying to grab here. The, it was an error by the Superior Court to allow U.S. Bank to do that, and the judgment should be overturned. And uh, we also request our attorney's fees and costs on appeal, and I'd like to reserve the rest of my time for rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. It's uh, Craig Hoffman on behalf of U.S. Bank National Association as trustee for Adjustable Rate Mortgage Trust 2004-2, Adjustable Rate Mortgage-Backed Pass-Through Certificates Series 2004-2. 
Your Honors, I'd like to start with comparing the settlement agreement to the judgment. The settlement agreement states that defendants agree to stipulate to a judgment of foreclosure under Arizona law in the pending action and to dismissal of all of the other claims by both parties with prejudice and with each party to bear its own costs and fees. And the judgment is for judicial foreclosure and states, quote, the remaining claims and counterclaim of plaintiff and the Vincent defendants are hereby dismissed with prejudice and with each party to bear its own costs and fees. So it's our position that the judgment does exactly what the parties agreed to. And in order to get to that conclusion, you have to carefully examine the language of the settlement agreement. So with that in mind, have you offered Ms. Fenson, if you give Ms. Fenson her $133,000 of equity, she claims? No, Your Honor, because we believe that the settlement agreement uh, did not prohibit us from uh, including the amount of fees uh, in the amount of the debt that's owed under the loan. It did not modify the amount of that debt. That's our position. And you can, when you read the settlement agreement, I believe it reflects that as well. For example, uh, in the critical sentence regarding uh, judicial foreclosure uh, and uh, the dismissal of the remaining claims, it mentions the word to, T-O, twice. There's uh, an obligation uh, if, the part, if the property was not sold by the strike date to stipulate to a judgment of foreclosure under Arizona law in the pending action and to dismissal of all the other claims by both parties with prejudice and with each party to bear its own costs and fees. And those are two distinct obligations. And what defendant is arguing is she wants to read the second two out of the agreement so that there's a singular obligation to judicially foreclose and dismiss all other claims with the provision regarding costs and fees applying across that singular obligation. But it's our position that the settlement agreement creates two separate obligations, one of which is the judicial foreclosure and a separate obligation regarding dismissal of the claims with prejudice and with each party to bear their own costs and fees. There's additional language in the, uh, the settlement agreement that supports that. For example, the use of the word other. The parties stipulated to a judgment of judicial foreclosure under Arizona law and to dismissal of all other claims by both parties with prejudice and with each party to bear its own costs and fees. So the settlement agreement makes a clear distinction between the judicial foreclosure claim and all the other claims that are being dismissed. In addition, uh, there are two with provisions in the relevant sentence in the settlement agreement. Uh, there is an agreement to dismissal of all claims with prejudice, and there's an agreement to dismissal of the claims with each party to bear its own costs and fees. And what defendant wants to do is take that second with provision and graft it onto the obligation to judicially foreclose. She ignores the with provision that's in the middle there that says with prejudice, because it doesn't make any sense to stipulate to a judgment of judicial foreclosure uh, with prejudice. That's, that's just a nonsensical uh, thing. So that indicates that both with provisions are intended only to modify the prior noun regarding dismissal and not the noun of judgment. And this is not just my argument, Your Honor. There's a, there's a legal axiom that backs that up, and it's called the last antecedent rule. And the Arizona Supreme Court uh, has applied that rule both in the interpretation of statutes and in the interpretation of contracts, specifically in an insurance contract in a case called Phoenix Control Systems, Inc. versus Insurance Company of North America. It's a case from 1990 from the Arizona Supreme Court. Uh, the site is 165 Arizona 31, and it's 796 P2D 463. And the Supreme Court said, quote, the last antecedent rule is recognized in Arizona and requires that a qualifying phrase be applied to the word or phrase immediately preceding as long as no contrary intent is indicated. And that's at page 34 of the Arizona Reporter and 466 of the Pacific Second. So what was that case about? It was about an insurance contract. Uh, an individual or company uh, was accused of uh, copyright infringement and it went to its insurer and it requested coverage. And the insurance company said that there was no coverage because the language of the policy at issue that was relevant stated that there was coverage for, quote, any infringement of copyright or improper or unlawful use of slogans in your advertising. And the insurance company argued that the clause in your advertising uh, modified both the infringement of copyright language and the improper use or improper and unlawful use of slogans language. And the trial court agreed with the insurance company and so did the Court of Appeals. But the Arizona Supreme Court reversed. Um, applying the last antecedent rule, the Supreme Court of Arizona found that the in your advertising clause modified only the preceding improper or unlawful use of slogans clause and not 
the first clause regarding the infringement of copyright. Uh, so the insurer had to provide coverage for the infringement claim, even though it arrives out of something outside of advertising. So if you apply the last antecedent rule here, uh, the clauses with prejudice and with each party to bear their own costs and fees only modify the preceding noun of dismissal and not the noun of judgment, which is much earlier in the same sentence. Um, another thing, Your Honor, that, that defendant's position sort of, if you take it to its logical conclusion, it, it puts the entire debt uh, under the loan at risk. And it's because the debt isn't just composed of things like attorney's fees. We have property inspection fees. We have recordation fees. We have uh, corporate advances, which could be characterized as a cost. Uh, and we have deposits made in escrow to cover things like taxes and insurance. So that's a cost. And you could even argue that interest is the cost of, of lending money. So if the, each party is to bear its own cost and fees language is applied uh, and permitted to modify the amount due under the loan, then the entire debt is effectively put at risk. And no rational lender would agree, uh, agree to that. And you can consider uh, the circumstances at the time a contract was made, and it should be construed in a manner so as to be reasonable and probable under those circumstances. And that's the California Bank versus Prudential Insurance Company of America case, 140, Arizona uh, 238, and that's an appellate case from 1983. Defendant's next argument is that we should have um, filed a motion pursuant to uh, Rule 54. Uh, Judge Thompson, I know you asked if that uh, objection was preserved. That objection was not made below. Uh, what defendant has argued is that we were somehow put on notice that the argument would be made and therefore it's been preserved. We disagree with that. We weren't put on notice that that argument was made, so it's been waived. If it's to be considered, Your Honors, we don't think uh, a 54G motion was necessary because that is a motion that's necessary in order for a judgment to say you, whichever party is, owe a direct financial obligation to the other party. In other words, you have to cut us a check. And that's not what this judgment does. This judgment simply articulates the amount that's due under the loan. Now, turning to the loan documents, both the deed of trust and the note permit including attorney's fees that are incurred in protecting my client's interest in the property and in including those in the debt. Now, specifically, Section 7E of the, the note says that after a loan is accelerated, uh, the note holder will be entitled to pay back by the borrower all of its costs and expenses in uh, enforcing the note to the extent not prohibited by applicable law, and those include, for example, and this is directly from the note, reasonable attorney's fees. Uh, what about the argument uh, opposing counsel uh, made that the, the most, if not all, of the attorney's fees bills in question were, were sent to and presumably paid by PNC Bank as opposed to U.S. Bank? Right. Well, PNC Bank, Your Honor, is the attorney in fact and agent for uh, U.S. Bank. So I think under agency law, that, that doesn't, their argument is not well taken. Uh, if something's paid by the agent, it's effectively paid by the principal as well. So the rights are, are sort of intertwined in that respect. Um, Defendants have contended that attorney's fees are not mentioned in paragraph 9 of the deed of trust. That's simply not true. Uh, uh, again, the deed of trust and the note permit the inclusion of attorney's fees incurred in protecting my client's interest in the property in the amount of debt owed under the loan. Turning to uh, Arizona law uh, and specifically Arizona revised statute uh, 33725 b it also supports the inclusion of the attorney's fees and the debt because in the case of a judicial foreclosure, the trial court's judgment shall provide that the plaintiff recover his debt, damages, and costs, and logically that debt, damages, and costs should include attorney's fees. Now, defendants say that this argument was, uh, should be disregarded because it was never asserted in the Superior Court. That's not true. It was asserted on pages 4 and 5 of the response to our, uh, their objections to our proposed form of judgment, so that has been preserved. Well, you're quoting from statutory language. Correct. Right. And presumably the legislature knows how to include the term attorney's fees in the statute if it really means to include it. Doesn't you know what, Your Honor, that actually came up before the Arizona Supreme Court back in 1933 um, in a case oh, called... I wasn't around then, but... What's that? <laughs> no, oh, sorry. you weren't around? Go ahead. Um, it's in the Federal Land Bank of Berkeley versus Warner case, Your Honor, 42 Arizona 201, 23 P2D uh, 563, it was considering a statute that is the predecessor to ARS uh, 33725B, and importantly, that uh, statute contained the exact same language saying, stating that the judgment shall provide that the plaintiff recover his debt, damages, and costs. 
and the court concluded that the term damages might reasonably include any expenses forced on the mortgagee through a default of the mortgage or such as attorney's fees. So if the legislature didn't do it, the Arizona Supreme Court has previously interpreted that to include attorney's fees. The case, by the way, was subsequently uh, appealed to the United States Supreme Court and overturned on a different ground under federal law. That uh, overturning had nothing or no impact on the conclusion that attorney's fees uh, can be included as damages under the statute. So it's sort of inconsistent, Your Honor, for the settlement agreement to say that the property will be judicially foreclosed under Arizona law, which sort of graphs on ARS 33725B, and simultaneously say that, well, the attorney's fees uh, cannot be included in the amount of the debt. That's certainly an inconsistency, and what defendants trying to do is read the Arizona, under Arizona law provision of the settlement agreement out of there, and you can't do it. We have to give every word of the settlement agreement meaning. That's, that's just, it's how you interpret contracts. Um, finally, the attack on the Thomas Declaration. Um, Ms. Thomas testified that she is employed by PNC Bank as a mortgage officer, that in that capacity, she was authorized to give the declaration, that PNC is the attorney in fact for a uh, plaintiff, and that PNC is the servicer for the loan at issue. That's a sufficient foundation for her testimony regarding uh, the amounts owed under the loan. And the phrase personal knowledge doesn't have to appear in a declaration to make that declaration valid. In fact, uh, personal knowledge and competency to offer testimony can be inferred from the declaration itself. Uh, that is from the Inray Capro case, which is a Ninth Circuit case, uh, 218 F3D 1070. It was cited by this court uh, back in June of this year in an unpublished decision entitled uh, Wells Fargo versus Hoskins. That's 2018 Westlaw 273 1621 at page 3. So, from the context of that declaration, Ms. Thomas has established both foundation and personal knowledge. And the attempt to uh, cast her declaration as one where she's merely uh, relying on documents, we, we don't think is well founded. She testified in paragraph five without reference to the exhibits to her declaration about the amounts that were due under the loan, articulated that it is $478,000 that are owed under the loan. Uh, that is based on her personal knowledge. It's based on her uh, position with PNC, who is the servicer for the loan. This is not a situation like the Eccles or Rita case law cited by defendant where someone is making or offering testimony regarding what somebody else said or when somebody else thought something might have happened to somebody else. This is based on, on personal knowledge. Um, and again, Your Honor, it, there has been no substantive challenge to uh, Ms. Thomas's declaration. Nobody has been able to, nobody's even attempted to point to anything in uh, the amount articulated as the debt under the loan other than my typo of 113000 versus 133000 There's no dispute that the total matches up to the Thomas Declaration. It's $478,000. Nobody has challenged any aspect of that $478,000 uh, from a substantive perspective. It's only been we don't think that they're entitled to uh, include their attorney's fees in the debt for purposes of judicial foreclosure. But nobody said, well, we think this was calculated wrong. We think you did interest wrong. We haven't heard any of that. Um, so for all those reasons, Your Honor, uh, we think that the uh, judgment of the trial court should be affirmed. Uh, unless any of you have any more questions, uh, I'm happy to yield the remainder of my time. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honors. Um, I wanted to mention first this last antecedent rule um, that Mr. Hoffman came up with today, not in the briefing. He never argued it in the answering brief. I had no opportunity to review the multitude of cases that he just cited to you. It should not be considered on this appeal. What about his general uh, argument that the, the uh, fee provision that party would pay its own fees in the structure of that sentence only applies to the, the other cases that were being dismissed. I think that's false. I don't think that that's an appropriate interpretation of the language. Um, as, as you can see, um, if you don't have access to it, the settlement agreement was attached as an, as an appendix to the opening brief. And um, it's really one sentence that describes the whole thing. If the house is not sold within nine months, which it wasn't, then defendants agree to stipulate to a judgment of foreclosure under Arizona law in the pending action 
and to dismissal of all other claims by both parties with prejudice with each party to bear its own costs and fees. If you read that, don't you think U.S. Bank is walking away from all of its attorney's fees and costs? Any reasonable person reading that would think that's what it meant. And in fact, that's what U.S. Bank meant. They changed their mind when they realized that they had wanted to get those attorney's fees. This was all agreed at the settlement conference, signed as a final settlement of the case. They walked away from their attorney's fees and costs. Now, uh, the parade of horribles that Mr. Hoffman gave you, that if you don't um, overturn this award of fees and costs, that they're not going to be able to collect any penny in their judicial foreclosure is totally unsupported by common sense, honestly, Your Honors. Um, we're talking about attorneys' fees and costs, litigation costs, that they walked away from in the settlement agreement. What was the mechanism of this settlement agreement you did, a mediation? There was a settlement conference, yes, um, before uh, retired Judge Kenneth Fields. And then, as a consequence, uh, did you, was a, an agreement signed right then or at some later time? It was signed right then, Your Honor, and page two um, in the appendix shows that all the parties and their lawyers and signed it. Was it simply filed with the court, or was it presented in open court in some manner? Um, I think it was filed with the court, but but then it became subject of a um, a protective order because the Finsons were given, part of the settlement was that the Finsons were given nine months to try to sell the house, and they didn't want it to be public record what would happen if it didn't sell. So, um, but so there was no opportunity in court for the parties to discuss this with the judge as to what was intended until there was an objection to the judge. Well, there were, um, there were disputes and disagreements about what this settlement agreement meant, and that's what I referred to before. Honestly, I wasn't involved at that time, so I can't give you this exact specifics, but there was a dispute um, by the Finsons about what this settlement agreement meant, and it was in that context that U.S. Bank filed um, a filing in Superior Court and said, nope. This is it. The settlement agreement is the full and final. And if there's something in here, if, if the Finsons wanted something in here, they should have made sure it was in there. That's it. You can't add another word. And yet here comes U.S. Bank trying to add a whole different meaning and a whole different provision to their waiver of fees and costs. Mr. Hoffman again argues that it was somehow our burden to tell them that they needed to file a Rule 54 motion. That's not our burden. Ignorance of the law is not an excuse. I cited you to that, particularly if you're a lawyer. You should know you need to file a Rule 54 motion for attorney's fees. Um, in terms of the Finson's argument that U.S. Bank didn't pay any of these fees, um, now Mr. Hoffman comes here today and says, well, PNC Bank was our agent, so um, their payment is our payment. Again, that was never argued. That wasn't argued in the answering brief, um, and it's also false. U.S. Bank didn't pay a penny for attorney's fees. With respect to the Thomas Declaration, um, <clears throat> the unsupported assertion has been made here by Mr. Hoffman and, and in the answering brief that um, she somehow provided direct testimony of the amount due? Well, there's no evidence before the Superior Court or before this Court. Did Ms. Thomas get every payment the Finson sent? Did she input that information into the computer? Did she um, go out and do all the property inspections that have been added on to the loan, supposedly? Did she um, calculate the interest due? Did she declare the default? Did she calculate default interest? Did she do all of that herself personally? Because if she didn't, she does not have personal knowledge of the amount that's due under the loan. And of course she didn't do all of those things. She's just a mortgage officer. 
But if she's the custodian of records for purposes of that proceeding, isn't she allowed to comment or testify as to what you can obtain from those records? Only if she provides the proper foundation. And she didn't. She didn't say she reviewed them. She didn't say she knew the preparer. She didn't describe how the documents were prepared. She didn't do any of that. Her declaration is incompetent and inadmissible. And it looks like my time is up. Thank you. Thank you for your arguments. We'll take the matter under advisement and issue a decision in due course. Courts in recess.